promise on my honor to be a better leader every day. Faithful and loyal to my country, organization, and fellow team members, countrymen and women. I pledge myself to remain true to the core values of integrity and self-discipline through my daily choices and actions. My mind is alert, focused at all times. I shall show respect to everyone always and every time. I remain a better leader and team player always. So I pledge. Welcome back. Indeed, we all pledge to remain committed to our fellow men and women in the world, especially in our country and the continent of Africa. This is Leadership 360 Conversation. If you just tune in, you are watching us live on Metro TV, DSTV channel 277, and we are also live on Facebook at Metro TV Ghana. Today, we are going to look at our continuation of our conversation around the SDGs, that's Sustainable Development Goals. The last two weeks, when we started off with Season 3 of our Leadership 360 conversation, we touched basically on the goals 1, 2, and 3. That's poverty, eradication, hunger, reduction in hunger, and then health, promotion of good health, within our societies. Today, we're going to continue the conversation focusing on the SDG goal, 14, uh, goal 4 and 5. That's quality, education, and gender equality. To help us have a more you know, diverse perspective on the ingredients around the quality, education, and gender equality, is our guest, our regular guest, Nana Bafo Obe Apo the first. Today, he is going to help us in our continuous discourse on this topic. On this note, Nana, you are welcome to. Thank you, Doug. Once again, to that. thank you so much. Now, last two weeks, or last week, so to speak, we we we. We had a, a lengthy discussion on poverty eradication, hunger, and health promotion as part of the SDGs. You gave a very vivid preamble to the SDGs uh, as you know, um, agreed to by almost 119 countries across the globe. And we've, we've learned a lot with regards to how these goals are interconnected, but each one of them work to complement the other. Today, we, our focus is going to be on quality education. Let me start off the conversation by asking, when we talk about education, what do we mean? Before we even talk about quality of it, what is education? Thank you, Doc. Thanks for the opportunity again. And uh, thanks to your viewers again for uh, viewing, tuning in to listen to such a fascinating conversation. I think before I do that, bear with me briefly. I'm also drawing a couple of viewers onto our program. And I want to do that by mentioning my big lobby group in Latte, Equiapem, the Latte Road Lobby Group, or the big uh, boys behind the construction of the Latte Road. I say kudos. And then watch, uh, you know, Leadership 360. That's essentially what we're doing. And I also want to um, acknowledge, you know, Asafuhine, Nana uh, Berima uh, Buampong, Asafuhine. He specifically asked that I mention his name today. <laughs> and also, uh, those are my overlord, my traditional overlord, Nankese, also Berima and Omafu, and all the people in my traditional area, Super Issue and Tsum and all that. I think it's good to see all of you here again. Thank you, dog. I salute so, them. so I salute everyone. Keep watching Metro and keep watching Leadership 360. Back to the germane question. And uh, you ask what exactly is education before we begin to look at quality uh, in that perspective. I would not want to be bookish. 
because anytime you get a question like that, the inclination is to be bookish. I won't know. But I am inclined to pull three, uh, you know, um, leadership offers and their views. Number one, Madiba Mandela. And I also look at, uh, you know, um, Martin Luther King Jr. And first of all, it's Einstein. You know, these, uh, as I was coming here, I tried to look into history and pull the four barriers of education and what they definitely think. Einstein actually looks at leadership and, and says that leadership is not about learning facts, but leadership, uh, no, education. education is not about learning facts, but education is about teaching people how to think critically and be creative. Then um, Mandela too says education is the only weapon. He weaponized education. That education is the only weapon to transform society. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, we all know him. He says the function of education is to teach. It's not is to teach one to think intensively and critically, and to build intelligence and character. Okay. So at the periphery, that's all you mean about education. Education is to train people's minds and heart to be able to think critically on their feet and to be creative. When we say that, it becomes diametrically opposed to the kind of education we are seeing evolve today in Africa where we are interested in reading, learning, and then forget, and then we get law degrees and we cannot create anything. Creativity, 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 and solving problems. That's, so, that's so, education. Thank you very much. So that, that goes to support the notion that it is not about being literate. It is about your ability to apply knowledge to solving problems. Is that the impression I get? That, that is the, the core of the, of the issue. In fact, not literacy per se is not education. Because there is this loose uh, cliche we say that even to progress, even when you are literate, you must always be prepared to unlearn and then you yeah. learn. So literacy is good, but it's only a baseline. Being literate to be equipped enough to solve problems is what education is supposed to do. Yeah. So um, now I will come back again. How do you then say, you touched briefly on the fact that what we are seeing across Africa all short of education. How then do we describe what we are seeing? What we are seeing is a wacky education. I think that is all I'll say at this How point. Wacky, what I mean is that, look, um, there is this empirical evidence that right into independence, Africa has had as many leaders, the, the entire African continent, our political leaders, and so have had masters to doctoral degrees, more than our colonial masters. If you look, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Dr. Kamuzu Banda, Dr. Soso and so, up till today, professors and all that, when you take our even colonial masters, Sometimes the bare minimum is that some lieutenant who went to the military and fought and is back and all that and is the prime minister or the president and all that. This is just a segment of the conversation. It's a broader one. It is the same thing with industry. When you are in Ghana or in Africa, the people who man your industries are people who are supposed to have had a very long checkered academic credentials. And yet creativity is zero. When you juxtapose that with, with the industry leaders and political leaders in the advanced nations, they barely have master's degrees. Yet, the discourse is that how come people with less educational certificate, if education is defined to mean long degrees, how come they don't have those long degrees, yet they are pushing their societies? And we are supposed to have people with long degrees, yet we cannot do anything. That is a complex question we need answers for. That is why we are here <laughs> on Leadership 360 to examine the goal, the goal four, which is quality education. Now, That's you've right. spoken about 
education in general, where you define it to be the ability to think, transformation of the mind to innovate and solve problems, if I may summarize it that way. And the quality part of it, what then do we mean when we say quality? Go4 talks about the fact that ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So the quality part, let's touch on the quality part. What will make our educational system quality or, or assume that qualitative or, you know, uh, posture? That's a profound question again. And, and, and good idea, you have rehashed the go for. And if you see what the go for is supposed to do on education and quality, it's also not just about quality. But it's also about equitable, equitable. equity right. and access, equity right. and quality, that sort of thing. But at this point, if we say what exactly will quality mean in the context of uh, the go for, you see, uh, it, it's a very simple thing. Now, um, the, of course, the, the goals, the sustainable development goals are comparative issues. So you cannot talk in isolation. You need to do benchmarking to appreciate what exactly you mean. But at the elementary side of the conversation, when you say quality, come on. There are too many people here in Ghana today for many, many years go to school and have no desk to sit on top of it. There are too many people, rooms without chalks. Others are still using blackboards and all that. Sometimes you don't even have boards. So quality it's an all-embracing concept in the educational arena where the infrastructure, mm -hmm. the teacher to teach is well-equipped and well-resourced, okay? And, and if you are running even basic free compulsory education, are you, are you not just, are you enforcing that the people, that, would it be intentional or you just decide to fashion out the policy, the policy hangs in Accra and people don't go to school? Because people cannot access the schools because of, say, infrastructural or some systemic challenges. Are you removing those systemic challenges? If it is about road, I see people get drowned sometimes on the estuary, on the Volta estuary, trying to just go to school. That is not quality. If you say you are providing free food for people to be able to access education and meet their sustainable development agenda for what time are you giving them food? If they are not getting food, even if they are getting the food, is the food standard food? Today, we are in an ICT environment. So you would understand that. Now, we are not even meeting the bare or the minimum quality measures. Now, when you begin to talk about ICT, then you begin to say, oh, then we are far about 100 years behind. Because look, our... The people we know in, in, in the advanced world, or even in Rwanda, let me not go, and every time that's what we do. Even in Rwanda, the young people in primary schools are on record to be getting tablets and playing with them. Amongst all that, that is the type of quality you want to see, and also making sure the books we are reading, the primary, secondary books we are writing and all that, they are all in tune with our sociocultural environment and not some classical information. Uh, you know, some people may have written 100 years reforms, updating technology, science, mathematics, mm -hmm. and that are able to solve problems within our, our locale. That will constitute quality. quality. It's a broad concept. All right. So the quality here, it cuts across. Yes. It's not just about the, 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 the teachers or the professionals who deliver education. It's also about infrastructure. It's also about the policy uh, implementation issues here and there. And the logistics. Logistics and all that. Now, from the leadership perspective across board, yeah. traditionally, religiously, and um, political levels, what, what are some of the key considerations or some of the key steps that we can take to promote quality education? Bottom line, I think education in Ghana, and I, I speak within the context of the Ghana, Ghana um, uh, environment, evolution, education is not 
um, it's not a trivial issue. So education actually has become a national matter. And so you see in Ghana that apart from the constitution, the 1992 constitution touching on education as a right and all that, under what we call the directive principle of state policy in the same constitution, the government actually is enjoined to make education, access to education, quality, etc., all becomes a national matter. So that is why we've got the Ministry of Education. That amply demonstrates that that's a very huge issue for government. So, yeah, leadership is pervasive because chieftaincy, etc., mm. etc., et at the chieftaincy level or the local level, well, you, we could run some philanthropy and also and see how we can help the poor and the needy people to get them access to education and not just education, but quality education. You know, at the NGO non-governmental level, there are massive effort to promote quality education and access. But at the center, which is where this whole uh, sustainable issues actually hinges, is that the government, the central government, because that's your baby, you have a duty to transform lives through education, through policy, public policy. So the public policy we run or we hatched out must always be very sharp and not just sharp a public policy but also a, a policy that is more linked to contemporary matters so now um, we already have a gap you know educational gap not just access access we are doing a lot in the middle at the baseline there are too many kids who don't go to school you would now require a central government that would be intentional to say that if we have the middle, the grade 9 to grade 12, which is SS1 to SS3, getting them access. That is on access alone. What do we do to the, yeah, the, basic, the basic, the primary? Because if you don't deliberately intervene, then as a poor country or as a developing country, you leave too many people off the cliff of the educational ladder and then we'll be struggling. So you need to begin to intervene through central public policy, access, infrastructure, logistics, teachers, coaches, mentors, computer, ICT, etc., etc., etc. And that can only be done invoking the directive principle and looking for resources, resources. to fund quality education. Okay. Now, well said. Uh, two quick questions with brief comments before we take our first break. Is education only about formal education or informal education is also part of what you describe? And then secondly, is our economic challenges responsible for the quality, the low quality education we are experiencing in, in our parts of the world? Clean questions. Number one, from the reverse angle, the economic challenges impact amazingly on your uh, quality of education. And so remember, taking you quickly back to no poverty, no hunger, no bad health. No poverty. Once you have poverty, it, it, it seems through all the goals for, to go 17. And so uh, speaking on education and poverty, yes, poverty means that your economy is not good. Either personal economy oh. or corporate economy or, nas or national economy. So the national economy isn't good. And since education is a nationalistic matter, then obviously your funding gaps in education will always be, be, be massive. Um, you ask again whether education is necessarily limited to formal education. And the answer is no. In fact, in the uh, sustainable development goals, when you read the goal for very detail, you will see that it makes room for lifelong education to all. Unbelievable. I love the sustainable development goals and the way the writers couch the phrases and all that. Making sure you get lifelong education to all. So yes, I mean, how many things do we even learn in, in school? Formal education. Formal education doesn't teach you too many things in the world. So there is this book I've read on the things Harvard University won't teach you. And I recommend that book for anybody who is interested in a long education. There are too many things. 
the Harvard universities, the University of Ghana and Tech and UCC and all the schools will not teach you. In fact, the things we learn and the things we get equipped with on this earth, maybe about 90% are on, on, on the job or in life. So you have the Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Sam Jonah, says, welcome to the University of the World. So it's a lifelong education. It's what matters. All right, Nana. Great submission so far. <laughs> US, we are having the discussion on Sustainable Development Goal 4 as part of the continuous discourse on the Sustainable Development Goals. Let's take our first uh, breather and we shall be back to continue the conversation. Looking for an excellent professional risk management and training solutions provider? Look no further. Your ultimate solution provider is here at V5 Solutions Limited. We support you with our professional skills in building capacity of your teams and managing all your operational risks. Our best bespoke solutions include private and corporate security risk management and training, fraud investigation, occupational safety and health management and training, project monitoring, evaluation and research, supply of private security, logistics equipment. Our solutions are professionally delivered with in-depth focus on people, processes and procedures, the environment and ultra-modern technology. Contact us now on 0303-957136 and 053-5176615 or send us an email at info at v5solutionslimited.com for a partnership that strengthens the company for an excellent sustainable productivity and profitability. Visit our website at www.v5solutionslimited.com for more details. V5 Solutions Limited, your ultimate professional risk management and training hub. Welcome back. This is Leadership 360 Conversation live on Metro TV, BSTV channel 277. We are also live on Facebook at Metro TV Ghana. Our conversation this afternoon is on the Sustainable Development Goals 4 and 5. We have been doing justice together uh, with Nana Bafo on the SDG Goal 4 so far. Uh, the next segment of our discourse will be on the goal five that has to do with gender equality. And to join us in this discussion on Zoom or via Zoom uh, is Dr. Genevieve. Uh, soon she will join us. And if we are able to get through to her, she will have, will have diverse perspective on gender equality related uh, issues. Nana, we spoke about the fact that already there are challenges uh, relating to uh, quality education across board vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rural uh, urban divide or the, 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 the challenges thereof. Uh, that also speaks to discrimination yeah. um, when the goal is actually uh, looking forward to eliminating such uh, you know, disadvantages. How within our spaces, you know, at the community level and the national level, how can we eliminate those challenges by way of, you know, stopping the discrimination somehow? Thank you. Uh, good to be back again. Let me underscore that the constitution we operate, and in many constitutions, discrimination is a heavily frowned upon uh, phenomenon. And so, um, but you can have either deliberate discrimination or indeliberate discrimination. So what we are seeing at this point in the, in the educational front 
I may call that indeliberate discrimination, but whether it is deliberate or indeliberate, it all boils down to discrimination. And that is why, um, you know, the, the only, there are about two or three avenues or vehicles to reduce that level of discrimination we are seeing. The first is through public policy and legislative instrument or executive instrument. And so I alluded to the directive principle of state policy in our constitution, which says that the central government shall, and it uses the word shall, shall take all measures, and, but there is a caveat or caveat or whatever, that within the government's budget strength, the government or the center is constrained budgetary-wise. And so the government may wish to do everything and create opportunities and ease all the infrastructural uh, inhibitions and, and the road and, and, and the classrooms and libraries and ICT centers and all that. I think it is the, the desire of every central government to do that. Because, you see, one thing which is not negotiable is that if education sinks or dwindles, the fortunes of education dwindles, it impacts on everything. Academia, a couple of years ago, held seminars with industry. And industry chieftains say, look, um, the, the, the products academia churns out are not fit for purpose when they come to the office. I'm sure we've had all this, uh, that sort of conversation. So what it means is that quality education is the duty of everybody. First is that the larger chunk of it is center, the central government. But through donations, I saw you uh, did some donations of some books a couple of weeks ago in the north. It's, that is the level of encouragement we would also expect. Because, you see, if the government cannot support all of us and individuals, and corporations and non-governmental organizations and churches can create access and enhance quality, then that will be one way or several platforms to actually bridging gaps and reducing discrimination. Yeah. Well, um, so let's talk briefly about technical education because I believe the space we find ourselves now, the stage of our development, we most people will argue that vocational and technical education is key to innovation and creativity and all that. What should we be looking at within that space vis-a-vis -vis quality education uh, as we're speaking about? Well, I think uh, my take on that, that is more passionate and, but also apolitical. Because, you see, we started quite well with the right orientation as a nation. And we had polytechnics all over. And, you know, because, you see, the evidence across international uh, arena is that you cannot have everybody wear suit and white shirt and blue shirt and expect society to progress. I always say one thing that even in Ghana, when it rains and our gutters are choked, we cannot de-choke them. We can't do it. We virtually can't do anything for ourselves at the technical level. Because we've converted all polytechnics into classical universities. The polytechnics were actually designed to build and equip individuals who will use their fingers. And remember, at the initial definition of education, we said creativity mm -hmm. to solve problems. Allow people, equip people with critical mindset, able to create and able to solve a problem. Look, dog. If we can read and speak all the most fluid English on earth or French and all that, and we are in white shirts and blue shirts and long degrees, and we cannot solve problems when our gutters are choked, that is just an elementary example. We, then we are in trouble. We cannot. How is it that when a Ghanaian migrates abroad, in the next few days or so or years, you are some scientist and you are inventing too many things, my Accra Academy cohort, one guy is actually in doing something very, very crazy at the NASA, you know. But if he had lived in Ghana, it wouldn't. How could he? Because the, the systemic environment doesn't allow that sort of creativity, explore opportunities, and, you know, that, that we don't. So everything else has become long school, university, 
if you hire someone to say, look, today come, we need to work on the farm. Now even on my coconut farm, even to get laborers to work and weed, they are not there. So what do we do? We need to equip people technically to begin to have machines that can, 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 can work on the farm. We need to uh, embrace more science and technology. Today, Kapo, the sad side is that the technical university Dr. Kwame Nkrumah built in Kumasi, where you were product, the evidence is that tech is doing more of the social yeah. sciences than the sciences that was historically designed to be a science and technical school. So give or take, I think we've got it all wrong and we need to come back again to the drawing board from an educational architecture and to redesign what, what we want to do. All right. Yeah. Just, um, Nana, somebody whispered to me before we came to the studio that by our, our cultural arrangement itself, it has become more of the case that every family just wants the child to go through the formal educational system from basic school to secondary to university and come out. And that means the person is educated. So the technical aspect is missing. So those who are into the liberals or the, the social sciences, more often than not, look at the technical students as inferior to those who are reading the, the liberal you know, subjects and all that. So your point you have made with regards to the technical aspect speaks to the fact that we, we must begin to look at, we must begin looking at the technical education to solve our basic problems in our society. And by that alone, we will be achieving quality education. So, viewers, we have had several submissions from Nana on quality education. We are going to move on to touch bit on gender equality, that is SDG 5, which has to do with, you know, ensuring equality for both genders, if so to speak. Now, when we talk about gender equality, what are we talking about? That's my passion again, because, you know, um, I got my, raised by my mother, my mother died, my grandma, and then now I have two daughters that I, I love so much. And so anytime you talk about gender matters, then my, my adrenaline is squeaking. Gender equality, you see, historically, whether by design or otherwise, systemically, we had, we've kept our women you know, on the low side. So at this point, you now have a female, especially in our contest, in our contest as Ghana, you have female, many homes traditionally will keep women to the, to the kitchen. And then, so as a woman, yours is to go and cook. And then you allow the men to now, the boys to play football and explore and engage in risky behavior and all that. And I also say that uh, when you do that, you don't let women learn. You don't let them learn. You don't give them opportunities. Also, domestic violence, using women to work more disproportionately, and also some traditional uh, practices, female genital circumcision, and a host of other things has historically kept women low and not giving women the opportunity they would require to compete you know, one-to-one yeah. -one with okay. men. So women empowerment at this point, women, uh, that, you know, that sort of concept means that creating deliberate opportunity for women, the mm. female child, to also compete boot-to-boot -boot with the males. It's going to be an interesting conversation on the SDG 5. Yeah. Let's take a quick breather, mm -hmm. and then when we are back, we will have Dr. Genevieve join us to continue the discourse. Welcome back, cherished viewers. We are live on Metro TV. This is Leadership 360 Conversation. Now we are, we are excited to have Dr. Genevieve Duncan join us live in studio. Doc, you're welcome to Leadership 360. Thank you. 
We are happy you here. Thank you. We've had this course on SDG 4 and SDG 5. We are just about starting. I know you are passionate about uh, women empowerment and uh, girls' education and all that. Now, the SDG seeks to equalize or bridge the gap between the male and female um, in all aspects, economically, educationally, everything. Uh, what is it that the SDG um, is interested in achieving, and how do we get it sorted out from your passionate perspective? Thank you so much. I mean, it's been interesting because I've been listening to the previous conversation with uh, Nana. And I must say that um, as leaders, I mean, we are all working towards SDGs. But like you said, I'm very passionate about a few of them. And one of them is what is on board now. That is SDG 5. And I want to say that as much as yes, um, based on <clears throat> cultural, societal, and what it has been, Women and men will never be the same. However, the SDG goals seek to ensure that nobody is left behind. And in leaving no one behind, it means that we need to give equal platforms for women. So I would want to take it from the, let's say, leadership perspective. So as leaders, what are we doing? Because I think it always starts with us. What are we doing in our own small ways to ensure that at least we are achieving some of these SDGs? So what do you do in terms of your um, aligning your SDGs to probably your corporate social responsibilities? And I will speak from my perspective. So what we do is that we are ensuring there is mentorship, there is coaching, there is at least an opportunity for the girl, for the woman to be on board. Sometimes I must say that most of these women themselves, based on cultural perspective and mindset, are very laid back. So as much as there is so much happening to pull them along, a lot of them are not willing. And so continuous um, education, pushing the agenda forward by all standards, all leaders, would go a long way. Another thing is for us to have some deliberate frameworks, deliberate legal frameworks, deliberate agenda in all, um, I'll say, corporate institutions, small businesses, wherever you find yourself. So that at least we give women the opportunity. We give girls the opportunity. When I hold the hand of another female and I mentor and I coach that person and I build capacity in that person, the opportunity will come when that person is ready. But if we leave them as it is now and we don't do much, what happens is that even when the opportunity arises, they cannot sit in that seat. And I want to see a lot of more women, I won't say 50-50 because it's, it's not going to be that easy. But at least we should see a more representation when it comes to women in the boardroom, when it comes to women in key leadership roles. Because as we sit here, if it was all men, it would be so stiff in the room. But once a woman is involved, you know, it brings a whole lot of different perspective. Your idea, my idea, and that is what inclusivity, I think, is all about. So I would always champion the cause of pushing the agenda for a lot more women to be built up to scale so that they can sit in where decision-making is done. Thank you. Look, um, there is also this usual expression out there that women are their own enemies. It's a controversial question that I'm going to ask you. What, what, what is your comment on that kind of thing, statement that people usually make? Um, I beg to differ. Although, yes, to a large extent, it's been said and overly said. And you see, once something has been the rhythm or something has been the narrative, people just accept it. But I want to look at it from a different angle. Okay. Women, yes, women naturally are a bit competitive. Women will not want to see another and say, oh, you're looking beautiful. You're doing great. Not because they are envious, but by our nature, most times, you know, you want to keep to yourself. We are secretive. We are not like you men who would just meet over a drink and chat and say so many things and, I mean, you just walk away. Women naturally don't do that. It takes deliberate effort for you to be able to pull another woman along, for you to be able to say, you are doing well, for you to be able to say, I love what you're doing and I'm willing to learn. So I want to take off 
that narrative. Mm -hmm. I don't want to stick to that narrative because mm -hmm. when we continuously mm -hmm. stick to that narrative, it stays. But what we can do is that let's replace the word competition with collaboration. Mm -hmm. So they are all C's. But I believe that if you define it and say, I am a woman, you are a woman. But together, when we put our forces together, there is so much more we can do. We, 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 we would be able to go away from this narrative. Because you men, too, well, sometimes you can be your own enemies. <laughs> but we don't say that a lot. So it's like, you men are okay, and we women. I don't want to stick to that narrative. All right. So before I come to Nana, the last one to you, before we also invite um, callers to contribute, to be what, in your view, should be the role of our men in supporting the gender equality agenda? Thank you. I must say a lot of men are doing so well, and I call them he for she men. There are so many men who are advocating the cause of women, even more than we women ourselves. I once met a man at the Winnipeg University, I've forgotten his name, he's a professor, during the Women's International Women's Day, and I was really wowed by the way he's so passionate about the cause of women. And he made a, a very funny, um, I mean, scenario of using women's perfume because He's so much an advocate of a woman that he would love to use our perfume because our perfume smells beautiful and nicer than men's perfume. That's what he said. But I want to say that a lot more men are doing so well because the whole idea is that you have daughters, you have sisters, you have mothers. So if you don't champion the cause of women, at the end of the day, it's going to affect your own generation. So what I would say is that for me, I have met a lot of men who are very, very much in tune with what women are doing and are even pushing us to do more. So I would say that I encourage those men out there to do more. And they should speak for us when they get the opportunity in the boardrooms and the decision-making room. Because for me, that is where we are pushing towards. It should not just be speaking for us and leaving us there. But they should sponsor a lot more women, genuinely. They should sponsor a lot more women. I am sure when I say genuinely, you all get it. So it should be a concern, a key concern, wanting to help somebody who has the key potentials you have identified and pulling that person along. Thank you, Doc. Uh, viewers, you can quickly, we, we have just a few minutes, but if you want to contribute to the discussion, um, you can reach out uh, to us on 0531-982298. 0531-982298. And let's... Do justice to this briefly, and then we call it a day. Nana, your comments? Well, my comments are just to reinforce her stance, and I'm so glad it wasn't going to be just me. Number one, I will point viewers to a document uh, authored by the World Bank. The World Bank actually wrote this empirical evidence that uh, if the world, we, are, we open up the space for women to participate, in society and in our economic setup, global GDP is likely to increase by 20%. Think about what the COVID has done to economies. So if global GDP expands by 20% because of inclusivity, think about it. There is also this profound and very, very fascinating uh, concept we call the glass ceiling index. That glass ceiling index actually measures the mobility, upward mobility of historically challenged people like women and sometimes blacks, but it has tilted more to women. And when you look into the glass ceiling in the index, you see, uh, you know, women climbing up gradually in social strata, but that kind of climb isn't so radical, but we expect more women uh, to encourage women and get them to climb the ladder, to be CEOs, to be presidents, to be prime ministers, to be finance ministers, to be professors, and all that. And as I said, because I am a, a, a mommy's son, and I've got my own sweet daughters, I will do anything uh, to promote women. So in my chieftaincy, look, if you come to my chieftaincy with domestic violence, and, you know, people with t -t -t Ghana old-fashioned mindset, where they, they hit, you hit your wife, and you come to my chieftaincy, dog, you are in trouble. You are in trouble. I don't spare people at all along those lines at all. I am, have a case, and this is just so classical, where a man says, I'm divorcing my wife, and my wife must get out of my house. And I said, when you married your wife, did you have a house? I said, no. I said, so your wife is also equally 
you know, entitled to everything you've got in your home. If you dare, I'm going to sponsor out your wife and we'll go to Waju. That is the type, those are the minor, minor, minor things incrementally we need to, to, to actually empower women. So the goal five isn't just about equality for the sexes, but deliberately empowering women because of vul systemic vulnerabilities, they must actually be, be pushed up more. The downside, dog, is that as we push women more, mm -hmm. we should also watch not to actually now turn the tables against our boys. That because when you do I'm that... You are going to <laughs> marry your <laughs> I was going to say that the school of thought has it. Now that the focus is shifting onto women, what happens to the boys? So those boys are likely to be left behind. Yeah. And when the women grow, they are the same boys they are growing up with. And if the mindset is not the same, you can be sure that a lot of um, you know, disconnects so will happen in society. So it requires delicate balancing. Delicate well, balancing. All too soon, time flies. <laughs> we, we, have, um, we have been, you know, making submissions or examining or dissecting the issues around SDG Go 4, that's Go 4 and 5, where we talk about quality of of um, education and then gender equality. This is where we're going to have to take our honor code because we believe that leadership has a critical role in all this. So let's take our honor code, the Leadership 360 honor code, and we shall be back to wrap up. I am a proud and firm African. I will take a stand. I will lead and be the change. Come and take my hand. For the safety, Hana, and welfare of my country and company come first. Always and every time. The Hana, welfare, and comfort of the people I lead come next. My own ease, comfort, and safety come last. Always and every time. Welcome back. Your closing remarks, Doc. Quickly, Very much. briefly. Yes. 30 seconds. I just want to say that to the men out there, don't see us as competition. See us as partners. See us as um, strategic partners. And to the women, when we get the opportunity, don't let us rub it on them. Let's just see that we are strategic partners. And I think once we get that basic understanding that we all have our roles to play, nobody is above anyone. We are partners. And everybody understands this basic thing. I'm sure it's going to be a beautiful world. And not leaving our men behind. Because if you don't, I have a son. So if I keep focusing on women, women, and I leave my son behind, my son is going to marry a woman. And I wouldn't want any woman rubbing it on my son. Neither do I want my son to rub it on a woman. So let there be that balance. And together, I think we can make the world a better place. Thank you. Uh, Nana? Yeah, thank you. Last word. For education, I wouldn't be here, and you wouldn't be here either. So my focus is also on education. And I encourage uh, viewers and, and everybody everywhere to weaponize education, just as Mandela encouraged all of us. It is only through education that people would have changed mind, changed heart, mindset, and to be able to actually hold women and understand that women don't compete with them, but they are partners because the creator of the universe made it the way it's supposed to be. Thank you, Doc. Thank Thanks you very everybody. much. Yeah. Cherish viewers out there, all too soon. This is the end of episode three of season three. Uh, we've had a very interesting conversation. Next week, we're going to continue our discourse on the leadership and sustainable development goals. I hope we have all learned something and we continue to learn learn and relearn to accelerate our leadership skills development towards the sustainable development of our community, our country and continent at large. See you next week. Bye.